three, two, one. Here we go! shifting gear season one, um, you know, I, I had constantly heard, uh, Cindy say, you're going to be blown away, uh, by this upcoming guest and just saying, you're, you're not going to believe her story or it's, it's going to be one that'll, that'll be for the record books for season one. And sure enough, my conversation with Renee Brinkerhoff was exactly that. Uh, so tonight, um, we're going to ahead of um, a very large and exciting adventure coming for Renee. We're going to deep dive deep into her story and um, what uh, kind of drives her and uh, the mission of what is still uh, left for this um, journey that she is on. So welcome in to Renee Brinkerhoff, uh, your guest on the evening for Women Shifting Gears, driven by Hemmings. Hello, Renee. Hello, Amanda. And hello, everybody. And thanks, Cindy and Tina and Hemmings and just for having me tonight. I'm so honored. Thanks so much. So as I, I know everyone saw the invite, but as just a little brief history of Renee, uh, Renee has currently raced on six different continents. Uh, she has a seventh one uh, that I think we'll dive into here in just a second. But uh, Renee, I want to go right back to the beginning with you. Why racing? Great question. I just, I want to start by sort of clearing the air of a lot of misconceptions. I didn't grow up with, a, in a family that is, was into cars or racing. I didn't know about cars. It wasn't something I was a passionate about as a child or, or anything like that. It was literally, I, I homeschooled four kids. I, they were out of the house. I was actually having free time. I was really enjoying life <laughs> and I wasn't looking for something to do. I wasn't, I was having a great time. And um, I, I realized that I'd been telling myself one day I'm going to race a car. And it was a subconscious thing. It's something I'd realized I'd been saying for decades and didn't ha have any idea that I'd been saying that. And then realized, you know, I just like, it was in my head. I was like, oh my gosh, I've been saying this. And I've been saying this a really long time. And then thinking, great, um, this is not something I want to be doing. This is not something... I have any interest in, but thought if there's, if I've been saying this for so long, there's got to be something to it. And I also felt, Hey, Renee, if you don't do it, you'll be on your deathbed and you'll ask yourself, what if, what if, what was that about? So that's how it all started. And that was in my mid fifties. And no background in motorsports or automotive. No, none, not at all. No car magazines in the house growing up or ever. My husband wasn't into cars. So it was, it was sort of out of the box. Okay. So what was the first step? Well, first step was uh, being mad at myself, getting over that. <laughs> uh, first, next thing was being really afraid, uh, you know, afraid of like, what in the world are you doing? You know, nothing about cars, you know, nothing about racing, fear of failure, fear of all these kinds of things and having to say, okay, forget that. I've got to go do this thing. I'll go do it once and then I'll go on with my life. And um, so I had to, you know, figure out about cars. And my husband's cousin had an old um, Corvette that he used to race at Laguna Seca. He invited us to come over to his house. He said, I just bought this car. Come on over. We happen to be in California. And they're parked in front of his garage in the gravel. He lived in Ojai. It was a 356 Porsche. It was the first time I'd ever seen that car. And when I saw that car, I said, that's the car I want to race. That's the car. So it really, there wasn't much study about it. It was love at first sight. And that was, I can't just check in the boxes. I got to do this thing. Okay, it's cool. It's going to be the 356 Porsche. And then it was, you need to know about racing. And I realized, okay, that car can't do a lot of things. So what kind of racing can I put that car in? And I heard about rally racing, track racing or, um, Road racing, I guess you call it, sounded boring. I know it's not. I've since had that experience and realized it's not. But if you think about it, going round and round on the same track sounds not very interesting. Rally racing 
sounded very interesting. So I said, okay, it's going to be rally racing. Someone mentioned a race in Mexico. So I just typed it on the, on the internet, you know, rally race Mexico and up popped the La Carrera Panamericana. And that's how the race got picked. So that's, that was the beginning. That's how I got into that race. And that's how I got into that car. And then what year was this? So I had the car, I picked the race. That was all 2012. And I thought, okay, this could be a massive harebrained idea. You're going to have to make it into a race car because what I bought wasn't a race car. And I said, let's go down. I should go down and find out what this race is all about. So because I bought a car that was, I ended up finding out it was beautiful, but everything that was represented under the hood and inside was not what I thought. So I got right away hooked up with a mechanic and I emailed that person. I said, I I want to do this race. Do you know anybody who's doing it? Got back to me and he said, absolutely. You won't believe this. But one of my customers was going to do it this year. It was the 25th anniversary. That was 2012. He said his partner just bailed on him. This was in the spring. And he said, you should contact him. No. (laughs) And he also was had a Porsche 356. It was a 57 356. So I said, okay, I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> I'm going to totally track this out. I reached out to him. I met him. I met his wife. And he said, I, cause I was thinking I'll make sandwiches. I'll clean windows. I'll do whatever. I'll be on someone's team just to go learn about this race and see if I actually want to do this. And he said, no, you know, if you pay for half, you can have a seat in the car and you can navigate and you can drive. So that was it. I went down in 2012 in his car and uh, my daughter, Christina, actually, who's on this call, came down with me to photograph. And uh, that was my first entree into car racing. When you go back to 2012, just when you get on site to the start of the rally, what emotions were you having that day? Wow. Okay. Well, the first day of that race, the first morning of the first day of that race, we drove by a car that had rolled in a field. And a couple hours later, we found out that the navigator was dead. Two days later, cars are going off a cliff. Um, people, cars are catching on fire. Being, people are being medevaced. I had no idea what I'd gotten into. And I remember the, so the first day I navigated, the second day I got behind the wheel and I couldn't stop shaking. I've never, I've done a lot of kind of gutsy things in my life. This is the only time I ever experienced uncontrollable physical shaking, literally from my toes throughout my whole body at the start. And they were counting me off and I knew I had to go. And I'm thinking in my head, what in the world are you doing here? Are you crazy? I knew I couldn't get out of that car. I couldn't turn back. I had to go forward. And after I got going, eventually the, the shaking stopped and I got this amazing experience of racing. So that was that was the beginning. And I would say at that moment, you would say you were hooked. I was hooked. I was, <laughs> I was totally hooked. It actually, as we get the slideshow set, it just hit me that uh, if you count 2012, which would have been your first race, uh, this is your 10th season as a race car driver uh, or 10th year. What do you look at your evolution from the beginning into where you are now? That race, that race, La Carrera Pen. So that's actually, you can't see how far those cars came down. It was probably 30 or 40 feet. And this was a start downhill, a fast start. And they were just, I don't know what it was. I don't know if the book said left and it was a right or whatever, but they were all launching off this cliff on top of each other. Um, That race was a total metamorphosis in my life. I look at it, I think of it myself as like, um, a butterfly and a chrysalis. And that experience brought forth all these things about myself I knew nothing about. And uh, I was so afraid every morning, but I learned through that race and every year that we did that, because I would continue to be, you know, have a lot of trepidation, uh, immense strength and life change through facing fear, pushing through fear, finding strength I didn't know I had. And I learned so many things uh, about myself and capacities and through that race. So that race really did prepare me for what came next. It was, 
it was really the, what I got from that is, was what has equipped me to do what we're doing now. And just a reminder, as we continue through this conversation, definitely throw questions into the chat because we're going to open this up to a Q&A uh, after Renee and, and my conversation. So absolutely throw those in there. I can't wait uh, to get to it. Uh, and, and it is worth noting, um, as you said, uh, with the career of Panamericana, it is noted as one of the most dangerous rallies in the world. And just seeing that photo of the cars down the cliff there. You're a new race car driver at that moment. How do you push through that fear? Guts. I don't know. I just, I just have, um, I believe God makes us who we are and gives us skills and things that unless we push our envelope and get out of our comfort zone, we will never know what those things are. But through that, I found this immense strength and ability to push through fear and actually harness fear and use that energy of fear to accomplish things that were way beyond anything I ever imagined. Um, you know, this was an accident we had in 2015, which we almost went off a cliff, almost took, um, I almost took myself and my navigator into what could have been a life, very much a, a life loss or a loss of limb. It was a very, very hairy situation, but uh, we got the car back into the race and, you know, ended up finishing that year second in our class, but all these kinds of experiences and all these kinds of um, failures and having to come back and be the comeback kid and make it work and find that strength and having that team and coming together and coalescing, um, never stopping, never saying, oh, we, like finding the part that we needed how do you find that part in the middle of in a middle of a race? We found it. I mean, that's a story in itself. Someone took it out of their Porsche collection in Mexico City, out of one of their classic cars, two o'clock in the morning, got it in our car, that very part we needed. Um, so many stories of like that. But um, really, this race is still to me, if I could go back and do anything that would really challenge me, that still would make me have to like push through kinds of fear that I don't like to talk about, but it would still be that race. It's still that race. You, at this point, as we talked at the beginning, you've raced on six continents and you race in awareness uh, to a mission that is very dear to you. When did the, when did it come about uh, project 356? When did this come a thing that you knew you wanted to do and taking your Porsche across the world in awareness? Because of our success as a team in this race, people wanted to know who are you and what are you doing? And we realized we have a voice and we can use that voice to affect change. We can use that moment when someone puts a microphone in front of your mouth and asks you a question like, well, who are you and what are you doing here? And give you a reason, give them the reason why. And that started in 2017. At the same time, you know, we were wanting to use this car literally as a vehicle for change. It was, what is it that we want to do? What is it that we want to do in this world? And at the same time, all that was going on, I found out about child trafficking. And at first it was, don't want to have to go there. That is a really hard topic. Uh, very difficult for people to want to hear about. And it seemed very insurmountable in so many ways. So, but after meeting a, a guy in the FBI that brought this to my attention, and then shortly after sitting next to a guy on a rental bus who had a pornographic image of a very young child, I thought, this is knocking on my door. This is something we have to do. And it came together that we just decided to focus on kids trafficked around the world and Again, I don't believe in coincidences. This was meant to be, and we're just following in this path and I look around and say, can't believe what we're doing. You know, it's um, beyond anything I ever imagined. So 2017 started this journey. When you see the photo here at the finish line, uh, what comes to mind? Wow. Um, it's a gr amazing emotion and feelings. Those people, you can imagine every day you come to the finish. It's a seven day race, 2000 miles through Mexico. Thousands of people are waiting for you. 
they're crying. They're, they're so excited about you. And I is typically the only woman driver in that event. So for, as a woman, when you step out of a car, they, the, the girls, the young girls and the moms and the aunts, they're all grabbing you, hold my baby. They're hugging you. They're thanking you. It's such a rewarding experience. It's, and to me, like that's Roberto. What a brave man. He got in that car with me, knew nothing with what I was doing. We had so many close calls. Um, amazing young man. It's just brings back, brings back so many amazing um, feelings and emotions. So we checked off North America with the race in Mexico. Where would be next? So the car was prepared as a tarmac rally car. So it was part of the planning of the races was let's do this the most economical way possible. So let's find the races for the continents. We knew we wanted to go off road. So the challenge was let's take this car if you really want to have a big voice and you really want to affect change, you need to do something outside of the box, right? And how do you do that in a Porsche 356? So we found the most challenging races that we could put that car in. Either there had never, ever been that car before, or there would never been a woman and that car before, but just trying to do things that would make us stand out. So again, someone's asking who are you and what are you doing here, right? So Part of that process says we left the tarmac with La Carrera and we went to target Tasmania for Australia. And that was a tarmac race. So that's where we headed next. And uh, that event was six or seven days. Um, first time to drive racing on the opposite side of the road. Um, it was a very different, it was a culture shock actually from leaving Mexico and this super dynamic race where the people are just, you could see that, right? The people and the enthusiasm. This was a very organized, very staid, very, um, very different kind of race. Very fast is a very fast. It's known for being super fast. 300 cars. We were the only 356 racing that year and the only woman driven, driven team that year. And the goal was to get the target plate. Uh, which I can explain, or you can look it up if you want. It's, but we got that goal. We got our target plate, and that was the, the, the um, Australia race. I have to add, I mean, just looking at those views, I'm blown away. What's it like uh, seeing uh, that kind of scenery out of the windshield of a Porsche 356? I have to tell you, I never see the scenery when I'm racing. Right. I'm looking ahead and thinking, what corner, when do I break, and how do I come out of that corner? I never see the sights, so it's nice to see the photos afterwards. That must be an experience for you. So when you, I mean, even looking back at, at a photo like this, is it, uh, when you see it from the other perspective, um, does that change the experience for you at all or just add it a deeper context to it? It just puts it, I think it just puts it all in context. What an amazingly beautiful place that was. All right. So in 2018, you clicked off uh, Australia. Where did you head next? We went to South America and we went to Peru. And the reason we went to Peru is they had an event called Caminos, Caminos del Inca. And Peru has a huge motorsports culture. That's like one of their biggest sports. They love rally racing, in particular rally racing. And this was their biggest race. And it's a modern rally. There are no old cars in this race. It's totally purpose-built rally cars in this event. And we were the only foreigners that came, people outside of uh, the country. Uh, first time to ever have an old car. And of course, then a first time to have a Porsche 356. And it was the first time for the car to go off-road. And uh, that was, again, six or seven days, 2,000 miles. Wow. And it was absolutely stunning. It was absolutely stunning. We were racing on average at 16,000 feet elevation. And again, you're in a naturally aspirated car. And um, you can see there, people stand there because that's a dangerous corner. Um, sheer drop offs, thousands of feet down. And it was amazing. The people were fantastic. They would yell. They'd never seen this car before. There's only one Porsche 356 in the whole country and someone's closed up museum, never sees the light of day. They would yell porch from the hills and the mountains. You could hear it. 
porch, porch, porch. And uh, then they would come running down the hills to see the car. And when you would stop, they would mass around the car. And when we had problems, they would be there to lift the car up and fix it, you know, tie it up with ropes and straps and, and do everything they could to get us back on the road. We were the underdog and they wanted to see us get to the finish. We went to two engines, later found out was because there were two mechanics gloves that were in that first engine. We had no idea. And that's why we were choking and choking the whole way through and smoking and smoking the whole way through. But we made it to the finish in Lima and uh, that became our goal, just get to the finish. I would imagine at this point, not only are you making headway, three continents are checked off the list at this point, but I imagine more and more people are becoming aware of the cause and knowing what you're trying to do with globally with human trafficking. In 2008, how, where is that conversation in alongside the racing endeavor that you're doing as well? So when we went to, uh, so when we, for every continent we went to, we purposed to find an NGO that was working hands-on front lines to combat child trafficking. So we supported somebody, an organization in Australia. And then when we went to Peru, we, or, uh, we supported two or three different organizations. And we actually went on the one day off that you have, we went into the mountains. It took us about four hours of driving to go visit with the Quechua children and to speak to them because those children are vulnerable for child trafficking. And we uh, supported the only uh, shelter in the country for victims of trafficking and gave money and gave things and did everything we could to support and talked about it. We, there were so many people. Um, you would see this race on every television station at night, the radio, every magazine publication, and they knew why we were there. And we were able to talk about uh, child trafficking and, and they had no idea this was even a problem in their country. So we were able to bring awareness and to bring funds to support the efforts there locally. All right, so now that we have knocked off South America, where did she head next? Peking to Paris, <laughs> right? 36 days, started in Beijing, China, ended up in Paris. That's us before we're crossing the border out of China into Mongolia. And um, wow, Mongolia was what most of, I think, the participants of that event look forward to. And that's where we had some massive problems with the car. Um, Mongolia is, is like that. And then in other areas, it's all grasslands. And as far as the eye can see, you will see not a telephone pole, not a building, nothing, nothing of the hand of man, nothing. But you'll see ca camels, herds of camels or wild horses and um, the, the yurts. And um, it was a stunning. And here in Mongolia, we, there are no roads so where we were driving. And so you had GPS waypoints and you had to find your way. You had to make your path and find your way. And uh, sometimes you got to see one of the other participants and sometimes you did it. But uh, yeah, that was, that was, um, I learned a lot of things. Every one of these races, I've learned a lot of things. And, and I got to tell you, it was, it seemed to be the same lesson I had to keep learning over and over and again until it hit me so hard with the hammer. It was like, pay attention, pay attention. Um, I, I realized that um, calm, confidence, is not competence. And um, so when someone says they know how to work on your car and they're giving you their skill sets and they're very confident, you need to do more vetting. You need to ask more questions, dig a little deeper. And then I also realized, Renee, you need to be able to step up and do these things and don't worry about offending the other person in your car. It is something that you need. I mean, it is my car, it is my team and it is, I'm paying for all this. And I. it was so hard for me, but it's okay if they don't like what you're saying. If you want to get to that finish, you've got to put all that aside and as graciously as you can take over and make sure you get to that finish line. Did you find that internal conversation more challenging being a female? Absolutely. It was, um, I think a lot of these, um, I will just say yes. <laughs> yes, it was because I was just, just to say very briefly, 
The same words can, can come out of a man's mouth with the same tone. But if it is said by a woman, you are now bossy or this or that, right? So it's very hard to overcome those. Um, it's just over hard to overcome that, but I had to. I just had to do it. If I wanted to get to the finish on some of these races, I had to. And um, anyway, that's sort of it in a nutshell. Well, it sounds like in, in reality, some of these decisions are life and death, uh, quick decisions that have to be made. Um, did you ever encounter any, um, any awkward interactions where someone would look at you and be like, oh, you're, you're the driver? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, the one that stands out the most is when I went to my first race outside of Mexico, right? We were invited well, first of all, I kept getting questions like, where's your husband? Uh, what are you doing here? <laughs> and then we went to an event that was actually a Porsche event, and it was a private event, and they asked us to be their guests, and they had me come up and my navigator come up, and the MC started asking questions about my car and all these different things. But he didn't ask me. He asked my navigator. So he looked beyond me and asked my navigator, and he said, I don't know. It's not my car. And he literally didn't know. It was his first time to be with me in the car and he didn't know anything about it. So instead of just then asking me, he went to the next question and asked my navigator the next question. And that went on for the whole, the whole interview. And I thought, that's really weird. I've never had that happen before. But you just have to laugh and roll with it. And it is what it is. And just do what you do it and do what you do well. So Peking to Paris was uh, in 2019. You had another race in 2019. What continent would you head to then? That was Africa. And that was the East African Safari Rally. And that race had never had a Porsche 356 before. And you can sort of see why. I had the opportunity to get in one of the uh, 911s that were prepared for this rally and go for a test. And that car just flew, just flew over every bump and rut and everything. You barely felt a thing, just bump, 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 hardly anything. In that car, it was like a sledgehammer. Every rut, every bump, it was like somebody was massively hitting you with a hammer. And it took one month afterwards before I didn't have to take a leave and my body didn't hurt anymore. Uh, the front, we, we, the, we were kept breaking the front arm. It broke a couple times, bent several times, but we made it to the finish and um, it, we accomplished the goal. What uh, I have to say, um, I might need a uh, coffee table book of all these photos, Renee. I don't <laughs> like I'm obsessed with everything you're showing and uh, still sticking with uh, the Africa thing. This is your sixth continent. Um, there is one that we haven't spoken about. This is 2019 and not to to get there. But uh, at this at this part of the journey, did you you knew that that project 356 wasn't complete yet. Right. We had to go to Antarctica, right? Yeah. So, and you know, when you set out to do something, sometimes it's, it's, you have no idea what that's going to mean, what that's going to entail. So when you say you're going to race on every continent, well, that means Antarctica and had no idea what those challenges were going to be until we actually got ready to prepare the car for that event. Well, before we head to Antarctica, we do have a video recap of Renee's journey through all six continents. One day, I'm going to race a car. I didn't think we'd get here, and we did. You come to this race knowing that you're taking a great risk. This experience enabled me to do even more things that I didn't realize I could do. Every one of those stages were just absolutely brutal. I just threw us in the mud. 
I had no idea how hard these roads would be. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm not going to quit. Well done, ladies. You can't explain it. It's just life change. It's a life changing experience. And to Antarctica, she will go. I know we have photos of that Portia. Uh, Renee, I have to just ask you what went through your mind when you, I was like, are those skis? What went through your mind when you saw this? Wow. I mean, well, first I have to say that part of this whole journey, um, Anyway, I just want to say that Christina Brinkerhoff and I, my daughter, who's working with me in this whole project, and who's helping with getting these photos and everything together, um, we walked into the studio because we were there to do a photo shoot before the car got put into a very dark container on a, on a cargo ship, right, for two months. And they had this big curtain and they threw back the curtain and there was this car and we were stunned, like, I was speechless. It was so magnificent. It looked so cool. And, uh, you know, and when we first started the preparation for this car, I talked to Kieran Bradley, who's the engineer that did all this work, uh, an amazing man, uh, a genius, uh, just a phenomenon what he's done here. Uh, I wanted tires. We've always raced on tires. I was, Kieran, we have to have tires. He ran all the formulas, did all the math. He said, Renee, you will need 42 inch tires. Do you realize a 42 inch tire in the back and a 42 inch tire in the tire? Where will your car be? You won't have a door. I mean, there is no car left. Your car is not big enough. So it's okay. Okay. So he designed these skis and he designed these tracks. People think, oh, it's a snowmobile. It is not a snowmobile. It is, uh, you have to glide. You cannot have any imprint on the surface in Antarctica because one second it can be powder and, 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 and uh, really deep, or it can be hard. I mean, it changes just like that. You have no idea what the terrain is. There's no place like it on the planet. It's constantly shifting. It's constantly changing. There's a crevasse bar in the front of that car to help prevent us from falling through crevasses that could be 10 feet or thousands of feet deep. So, and winds come up and create these, walls of ice that you can't even see and it's like hitting a concrete wall so i mean or massive boulders of ice it forms through the wind so he is uh kieran and jason kieran did the uh, engineering jason will be with me in the car they have both driven to the south pole twice in a modern vehicle they know what things we can encounter and those things were incorporated into the development of this car and uh, I've never driven it. I'll get my first chance when we get down there. And um, wow, it's just, it's magnificent looking, isn't it? I think it's, it's, uh, it's also important. I, you're looking over uh, your car and, and sponsors and people that are supporting you on the journey. Uh, PXG and, and how crucial is it to have such great people on your side? It makes every difference, doesn't it? I mean, it's first of all, it's a team. It's always a team. And my family, my, my family has been so supportive. Um, they won't, Christine will be the only woman from a family in this race, but in all the others, they come for the end or they're a phone call away, whether it's two in the morning or whatever. Um, I got a phone call. We were, this car, this is a different livery. We had designed the livery. We, Christine and I worked on that livery for probably nine months to get it perfect. It had just been finished. We were in London to see the car, meet with the team. Again, it was going to be you know, shipped off. I got a call at nine at night on a Friday night. And uh, the photo shoot was on Monday. And my phone, I'd sent out a message to Bob Parsons, who's the GoDaddy founder and who owns PXG, Parsons Extreme Golf. And uh, he got, I got a text back that says, Renee, I don't think this is anything I'm interested in, um, but I'll talk to you. He says, I'll, I'll contact you in the next week. 
Well, for, for the week to end, it would have been Friday night. So Friday night, about nine o'clock, I look on my phone. It's Bob Parsons calling me. <laughs> and I don't know Bob that well. We're, we're you know, friends, but we're not close friends. And uh, I'm thinking, I'm looking over Christina. We're working. We've got some documentary on the TV. We're sitting on the bed working. It's okay. She said, oh, my gosh. Okay, I'm grabbing this call. He's, and he's prefaced by saying, again, Renee, I don't, don't think I'm interested in this, but tell me what you're doing. I'm, I'm here. So just give me give it to me. And uh, he, he uh, within eight minutes, he said, I want to completely sponsor your Antarctic race. And I want to give you $100,000 for your charity. And what you're doing is incredible. And I'm honored to be a part of it. So that was a massively life changing moment for us. Um, I, all my savings and savings for years and years were gonna, was going to go into this, and now I had somebody who was going to, you know, to to, to send us there. So, uh, yeah, that's people like that. The Parsons are amazing, and to have them on my car and to be with us, and it's just, it's I'm so grateful. So, how does this work now? You have a car. It has to get to Antarctica. You have to get to Antarctica. And then we're going to drive on to Antarctica. I imagine that the logistics of just that takes months to prepare for. And we're still doing it. <laughs> it's, you know, with COVID, you know, it put us back a year. Uh, and you would think that would have given us plenty of time. But as everyone's hearing right now, there's all these supply shortages. I probably spent uh, six hours a day just trying to get Christina and I gear to wear to try to find things to wear. Uh, I've been working on this for uh, quite a while. It's, it's uh, trying to get the car there, the paperwork, you know, all the customs. Um, it goes in on an Aleutian Russian cargo plane. Uh, we will go in on the cargo plane as well. It, uh, we will land on the blue ice. There's nothing there. It's not like those wonderful pictures that you see of people visiting Antarctica with the penguins. There's no life. There's not even an insect. And, um, Ice, ice and more ice. Um, we're camping, we're sleeping in tents, um, you know, camping food, dry, you know, the dried food, you add hot water to. Car doesn't have a heater. There's no point. It's pointless. You have to wear on that plane when you leave Chile and land in Antarctica, what you will wear the whole time you're down there. You don't have a change of clothes. You have, you can bring extra socks and some under things, but that's it. Everything has to fit in that car. Two tents, you know, cooking stuff. Everybody has to be self-supportive. And the reason you don't, there's a pointless to have the heater is because if something happens and you step out of that car, and if it was a heated car, you have to be dressed for what's outside. So the environment inside that car has to be the same as the environment outside of the car. And um, yeah, it's all going in that car, our food, our tents, our sleeping bags, any, anything we might need is going to be with us. I do want to open up to uh, the questions in, in the chat room. And I know that uh, we have, uh, we're going to share a link about how to donate to Project 356. Uh, but when you go back to the beginning, Renee, um, where do you think that voice came from? Someday, I wanna, one day I'm going to race a car, <laughs> that voice. <laughs> I have no idea. I think it was. Um, something I could have said anything. I'm going to go to Mars. It wasn't something I ever thought I was going to do. It was just, I think I, I quite honestly, I think I struggled with depression and um, I had a very adventurous upbringing and I did, chose not to take a professional career, but to be a professional mom. And I chose to homeschool my kids and to do that and to do that well, I chose not to pursue anything that I yearned for. So I think I told myself that, and again, it could have been anything, just to something to look forward to, just to get out of bed in the morning and face a tough day. That's the only thing I can come up with. I don't know any other explanation. How thankful are you that this is your purpose? I am so blessed to be with that team, with my family, with that car, doing something for kids that are trafficking. I actually go undercover as an investigator to get evidence to give to law enforcement. I've talked to traffickers. I've seen the girls they're selling, the young girls on their phone. 
I've sat with the young girls that are being sold. I mean, those things are really, really difficult. And it takes weeks to process that when you come home. But I would never want to trade any of that. I feel like I'm the one blessed in all this to be a part of this journey. Um, it's um, changing my life and hopefully the lives of kids that are being trafficked. All right. I do want to, uh, we're going to get to the questions. I do want to put uh, Christina on the spot quickly. So unmute mute yourself. Um, is it hard for you to watch your mom do this? Is it hard for me? No, it's amazing. It's amazing. There are, I'm, I've been filming on every continent. So I'm always there, you know, in a follow car or media car. And there's definitely an element of low grade panic a hundred percent of the time right? Because I'm so in tune with where she is and where she isn't. And when that car doesn't come for hours, um, I'm wondering what happened, right? Because I've, I've seen the crashes. Um, so that's, that's certainly a part of it. But it's amazing. I mean, talk about a living inspiration, right? All the time. It's, it's something to aspire to, you know, may I be so brave. So um, no, that's I'm a blessed by it. That's alongside your mom. Oh, that's just a gift from God. I mean, it's, and we, and we're not, uh, it's not lost upon us. I think we say this all the time. I'll walk in the office and like, can you believe we get to do this with each other? <laughs> and can you believe we slept in a tent in Mongolia and stayed in a $6 room in Kazakhstan. And we've just been through so much and so many ups and downs on every continent and seen, seen a whole lot together and what a blessing to be able to do it together. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, both mm-hmm. for sharing this uh, incredible hour, hour with us. Uh, Renee, I am going to put you on a little bit of a hot seat so we can uh, get through some of these incredible questions. I'm going to go uh, from Cece at Haggerty. Did you go to driving school? I did go. To, I went to the Porsche driving school. It was pointless. That's a modern car, massive horsepower, all the save me features. And I'm in a 125 horsepower car with no save me features. So, uh, and the feel is totally different. So I did try, but it didn't work very well at all. It was really every race I went, it was, that was my learning school. That was my school. That was my learning was when we were racing. From Pam Miller, did you have any extreme hobbies before deciding to race a car? No, my life was dedicated to those kids and giving them just like helping to create these amazing citizens of the world and individuals. That was it. That was my hobby. Back in 2012, how much did you know about the car technically? Before I started racing? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, From Diane, what uh, training did you do before 2012? Uh, on the road, off road, and where did you test the car? Again, La Carrera, the car took two years to be developed. We never got to test it. I tested it when we went and did the qualifying round day prior to the race. Never got to go to a track. The year that we actually got to test the car was the year we had the worst accident in 2015. And, you know, we had the tire pressures all dialed in and everything. And then come to find out why I was screaming at my navigator, something's wrong with the cars. Every single tire was overinflated by 20 pounds. So um, I, not much testing. Well, from Tess and I, I love this one. What do you wish people knew about this sport? Rally racing? Wow. What do, it, is, it is so dynamic. And especially when you go to like Peru and Mexico and some of these countries, the experiences you have with the people, the people that will open their shop in the middle of the night for you and do everything they can to get you back on the road. And they want nothing but the t-shirt with your team name on it. That's it. I mean, it's just the passion and it gives you this experience of meeting people uh, all throughout these cities and these countries that it is just so phenomenal. I think this, uh, this was specifically to the Panamericana, but I think it could be on a broader spectrum as well. How many other female drivers or female navigators do you come across? Very, very few, a handful. Most of those races, I'm the only woman driver um, or, or one or two others. Uh, Lawrence, uh, he's talking about that first ride along with a race car driver and you go into a corner at speed. Have you ever had such an experience like that? 
Would you ask that again, Amanda? Is he mean kind of like a like a ride along with a real race car driver? But when you take a corner at speed for the first time, what was your experience with that? I loved it. Loved it. <laughs> Never. I if a driver knows what they're doing, there is no fear with that, right? Because it's totally in control. So I, um, yeah, it's thrilling. I love it. What keeps you centered? My faith in God. Quite frankly, um, that's, I get into that. It's my source of peace and direction. And um, I've gone through, I've had a lot of personal struggles through my life and those things have given me strength. And then I have an amazing family. Mercedes wants to know, how many days are you expecting to be in Antarctica? We get there December 5th. That's the plan. Again, those dates fluctuate with weather. It is the most capricious weather on the face of the earth. Uh, so we have a flight scheduled to land December 5. We have a flight to, to leave, I think, December 15th or 16th. But if something happens with weather and we have to wait a week or whatever to get our goal accomplished down there, we will be there as long as it takes. Rally races are days on end. I think from the peaking to Paris, I think you said it was 36 days or over a month. How do you manage the relentless daily stress? You know what? I don't get stressed by it. I ended up in Paris wanting to go back. Literally, I was telling, I want to go back and start again right now. I I want to go back and do it right. There were so many things that were avoidable that we could have overcome and I, I wasn't tired. I was ready to go from the beginning again. And um, I say for every day that you're in one of those races, it takes that many days when you come home to get off of that high. And it is such a thrilling high that I'm not tired during it. What's the inspiration behind the name Valkyrie? You know, we came up with that name um, shortly. So right after we raced in 2013, we won our class. We came home and it's like, I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to finish preparing the car. We've got to do this better, you know? And so we needed a race team. And um, the name Valkyrie was thrown out by, I think, by a family member. And then I saw a photo of a Valkyrie. And what I knew about it, it was a woman warrior from Norse mythology. I didn't remember much more than that. Come to find out it's Norse mythology. Valkyries are women warriors with courageous heart. They leave Valhalla, which is their heaven. They go to the battlefield to rescue the wounded and the dying that are worthy and restore life in Valhalla. They take them back to Valhalla to restore life. And that was before we got into child trafficking and all of that. And I thought, what in the world? How more fitting is that name? And uh, again, I don't believe in coincidences. Well, I know we always uh, go uh, over our allotted time on these conversations. Cindy, I do want to welcome you back in. I'm sure you have uh, a couple of things that you would like to say to Renee before we close this thing completely off. But um, I'm also okay if everyone wants to unmute quickly and clap so that Renee can hear it on her adventure and her journey and what she's doing. <laughs> But uh, what an inspiration. I, every time I hear you speak and um, it's almost, uh, I still, I, you guys uh, probably know the movie, The Devil Wears Prada, but I, I read an article one time about Glenn Close preparing for that role and they were just blown away when uh, Glenn opened her mouth and um, the lady she was playing and she had this calmness and this voice, like to me, Renee, you have such strength inside of you that it just, uh, without even, um, like this, your just, your aura is so mega. And every time I cross paths with you or speak with you, I, I walk away just unbelievably inspired. Gosh, thanks so much. Okay. I want to say one thing, Amanda, before we say goodbye, I have to tell you, donate three, five, six. If I get off this call, I don't tell you. We're trying to raise a million dollars. We're at half a million. We just got to a half a million. And it doesn't have to be $356 to get your name on the inside of the hood and our special Antarctic Guys Challenge hat. It can be anything and it can add zeros to that or whatever. But come alongside us. Help us to do something about child trafficking. We support education. We're actually involved in rescue. Hands-on, we do that. And, and rehabilitation, we, we support um, homes for these children. 
So we need your help. We want your help. And uh, second largest illegal business in the world, $150 billion. Uh, millions hey, Renee. Of you yeah. know, you get this really cool hat if you make it. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. I'm honored to wear your hat. <laughs> and I'm honored to be on your car. And um, this year in Nashville, we had the Women with Drive Summit and we invited Renee and Christina to come out and we honored her with the first ever Shifting Gears Inspiration Award this year. So you are amazing. One of my favorite things about you, Renee, is that you have two girls and two boys. Mm -hmm. So when you started to race, what did the girls say and what did the boys say? <laughs> go, mom, go. That was my daughter's. My sons, after the first year or two and seeing all those accidents and people going off cliffs, is mom, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> Aren't you done? Don't you want to quit? <laughs> so very different reaction. But again, once I say, yes, I want to do this, they've all been behind me. So we're going to be with Renee Thursday night at the Peterson Automotive Museum. I'm playing understudy for Amanda. I don't know how I can compete with this, Amanda. But there's going to be an auction with Amaz on a 356 to help raise money. That might be embargo, but you guys will hear more about that. And then if anybody's going to be in the Denver area on December 20th, it's going to be the big kickoff party at Renee's restaurant. Bob Parsons will actually be there. I'm going and I'm honored to be invited, actually, Renee and Christina. Um, Wait, Cindy, it's November 20th. I mean, December I say, sounds fun, too. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> let's all have Christmas together, right? <laughs> you'll be you'll be back by then. Um, but Renee, you are just amazing. And in the chat room, you could see these, the love for you. And we'll say lots of prayers. We know that you believe in Jesus and, and, and God speed to you, Renee, you are, you are one mighty warrior. Not my strength, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You guys, thanks for having me as your guest and to allow me to share the story and um, so honored and humbled. Thanks so much.